Investment Vehicle. I'm Joyce, Investment Analyst with Philip Futures. In the next 20 minutes or so, I will bring you through a brief introduction of how to invest in the corn market by trading corn futures. Disclaimer. This presentation is solely for educational purposes only. Do not treat it as investment advice. Here is the agenda for today. We will be looking at corn and its users, its supply and demand figures, historical and present, how to make use of financial futures as an investment vehicle to trade in the corn market, and lastly, seasonal patterns in the corn futures market as well as some factors that influence the prices of the futures. Firstly, corn as a commodity. What is commodity? In short, it is a raw material or primary agricultural product that can be bought and sold. Raw materials include metals such as gold, silver, aluminium and zinc. Energy goods such as crude palm oil, Brent oil and natural gas. And agricultural products such as corn. Agricultural commodities can be further subcategorized into grains such as wheat, rice and corn. Oil seeds such as soybeans and soft commodities such as coffee, sugar, cocoa and cotton. Bear in mind that not all commodities can be used as an investment vehicle. To qualify for one, it must possess three important characteristics. Firstly, it must be tradable. Secondly, it must be deliverable. And thirdly, it must be liquid, meaning it has an active market in which buyers and sellers are constantly transacting with each other. So, what are the uses of corn? Ground dried maize, commonly referred to as cornmeal, is a major human staple. Cornstarch, obtained from the endosperm of the corn kernel, is used as a thickening agent in soups and liquid based foods to give them the slurry paste like texture. One bushel of corn can be made into 1.55 pounds of corn oil. Corn oil, because of its high smoke point and generally lower price than most other types of vegetable oils, is valued as a frying oil. It is also the key ingredient in margarines. High fructose corn syrup, HFCS, is an industrial mix of corn glucose and fructose, a type of sweetener processed from corn that is widely used in beverages, cereals, breakfast breads, yogurts, soups, and condiments. Apart from food uses, corn can also be processed into ethanol through fermentation and distillation. To further illustrate the importance of corn products in our daily lives, statistics show that on average about 50% of American human biomass can be traced to corn consumption. U.S. total corn acreage can cover the entire land of Germany. And corn yields have increased 500% since 1931. The following two pie charts show the proportion of corn used for each of its major purposes. Animal feed and in residual uses, bordered by the red portion. Food, seed and industrial uses, bordered in green. And exports uses, bordered in white. These are the three categories commonly used for reporting purposes. The United States is the largest producer, exporter and consumer of corn. Changes in consumption patterns of corn in the United States will affect global corn usage. We will now take a look, closer look at each type of corn use. Feed use. Recall from the chart we saw earlier on, 56% of global consumption is used for animal feed. Corn is a high energy ingredient in feed and used for livestock such as cattle, pigs, lambs, chickens and turkeys. 
It is highly desirable because, when fed to the animals, it significantly shortens the time to fatten the livestock. In the US, some 95% of livestock feed is made of corn. Although there are good substitutes for high energy ingredients in animal feed, such as low-grade wheat and soybean, corn is still the most commercially viable and preferred choice for farmers. Food seed and industrial use Corn can be cross-pollinated to achieve desirable characteristics that can be processed and extracted by industrial means. Apart from food uses mentioned just now, corn can be made into plastics, fabrics, adhesives, and many other chemical products. Its byproduct from the wet milling process is also widely used in the biochemical and re research industry as a culture medium to grow many kinds of microorganisms. Of all its industrial uses, the most valuable use is still as an alternative fuel. Moving on to the supply demand trends. The marketing year for corn is September each year to August the next year, and we are currently in marketing year 2012-13. The top five producers of corn are the United States, China, Brazil, the EU27 countries, and Argentina, denoted by the area in yellow. Together, these countries account for about 75% of global corn production. Global production has been volatile. The shape of the total area under the graph, which denotes global production, closely resembles the shape of the dark green portion, which denotes US production. Hence, we can draw the conclusion that global production is heavily dependent on US production. U.S. production has undergone much uncertainty due to adverse weather conditions. China and Brazil have ramped up production over the years, while output in the EU stays rather flat. Overall, the world produces sufficient crop to cover global consumption in 5 out of 13 years from the year 2000 to date. Production output is dependent on area harvested and yield of crop where U is measured by metric ton of corn per hectare. From the graph, we can easily see that while yield has more than doubled in the last 30 years, area harvested, which is directly linked to acreage, increased less than 50%. The rationale follows a very simple thought process. While scientific discoveries, technological advances and improved plantation management increases yield, acreage is constrained by the availability of land. Although corn yields generally spot an increasing trend, there are obvious dips in the climb. The volatility in yield is mostly explained by external factors such as adverse weather conditions and pest and disease infections. The production trend closely follows the advances and dips in yield. Export supply is dominated by four major exporters, US, Brazil, Argentina, and Ukraine. Just five years ago, the pie chart would have looked very different. US exports as a percentage of global exports was almost twice as much as current levels, while Brazil and Ukraine used to account for only 8% and 2% of global exports. The shift in reliance away from US, as we will see later, is due to increasing domestic industrial consumption of corn ethanol since the enact of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. US corn exports more than halved from 61 million metric tons in 2007 to 31 million metric tons this year. At the same time, Brazil and Ukraine increased production beyond self-sufficiency levels. Now, putting production and consumption together, consumption approximately increases by 20 million metric ton notches every two to three years. In the meanwhile, production is rather volatile and much unpredictable, trending below consumption 50% of the time. 
Zooming into the components of corn consumption, feed use and export use indicated by the orange and purple regions increased steadily over the years. But there seemed to be a sudden spike in industrial use. Why is that so? Recall we talked about corn ethanol and the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, the EISA. The EISA mandates that 9 billion gallons of renewable fuel to be blended into transportation fuel in 2008 and 36 billion gallons by 2022. That is to say, regulations actually create a new demand for ethanol. But is ethanol here to stay? Most definitely, I would say, the motivations for renewable fuel and corn trading can be traced to politically costly reasons, such as fuel security and reduced reliance on Middle East oil producing countries. Social security and political clout. Since biggest corn producing state, Iowa, grabbed the lead position in presidential sweepstakes four decades ago, support for corn and biofuel has become almost a prerequisite for presidency. Having examined the fundamentals of corn, moving on, let's explore how we can tap on these trends. Corn can be traded as a financial instrument in the form of a futures contract. But what is a futures contract? It is a standardized agreement with specific terms traded on an organized exchange to buy or sell assets at a fixed price but to be delivered and paid for in the future. These are the key standardized features of corn futures listed on the Chicago Board of Trade the benchmark contract for globally traded corn. Notice that there is a daily price limit of 40 cents per bushel. This is to limit the volatility of corn futures. Settlement can be made in the form of physical delivery of goods or cash settled for the difference between the spot price of the asset and the price agreed in a future contract. Traders would usually take delivery while speculators and funds would cash settle the contract. But why trade futures, you ask me? For corn producers and consumers, they use futures to hedge against a drop and rally in commodity prices respectively. But for individual investors, commodities futures can be used to express their views on the direction of the prices of the commodity. Instead of expressing an opinion through the shares of a company dealing with commodities, Trading on the commodity itself does not require consideration on management capability and financial position of the company. Commodities trade a lot on its own fundamentals and can record significant gains even when the global economic environment is gloomy. Another major benefit of futures is that it is highly leveraged because futures can be purchased for a marginal good faith deposit called margin. This margin is typically 3% to 12% of the total value of the contract, thereby giving investors greater flexibility and maximized capital efficiency. For example, at current prices of about 750 cents per bushel for December 2012 corn, one contract of 5,000 bushels costs about $37,500. The initial margin required for the contract is about 1,700. That's merely 4.5% of the value of one corn contract. If the contract rises by 10 cent per bushel, that will return a profit of $500 with an initial capital outlay of only $1,700. That is almost 30% return. However, bear in mind that leverage is a double-edged sword and can also amplify losses. Lastly, Unlike many other financial instruments such as bonds, warrants, and shares, an investor can not only long the contract but also assume the short position. This gives market participants much flexibility to speculate price direction. Now having established the fundamentals of corn and corn futures, in this last section, we will examine some seasonal trends and briefly introduce some factors influencing corn futures prices. 
to lay the foundations to your first step in corn trading. What is seasonality? It is the phenomenon that causes crop prices to behave in a relatively predictable manner year in and year out. The two major components of crop seasonality are harvest lows and post-harvest rally. Seasonality in agricultural markets is a function of supply and demand factors and sometimes of perceived supply and demand. For agricultural commodities such as corn, Harvesting, planting and weather conditions are major supply stimuli, while feed demand, seasonal consumption and export patterns are the main demand stimuli. In the largest producing and exporting nation, US, planting takes place from early April after the cold frost is over to late June. The key yield determining stage for the corn crop is the silking stage. Silking is in fact the reproduction stage where pollination occurs. Hot and dry weather dehydrates silks and causes the plants to miss the window for pollination. A lack of sufficient moisture at this stage can reduce yields up to 7% per day. Silking, which usually happens about 70 to 75 days after planting, takes place from mid-June to early August and harvesting typically starts in early October. Not coincidentally, weather conditions are tightly watched from June to August. In 2012, a prolonged heat wave that swept through the US corn belt from June to early August decimated the corn crop and drove prices to record highs. China's planting and harvesting seasons are below. Although China produces about 24% of world corn supply, it is barely self-sufficient and does not usually have any exports. However, China's corn crop is susceptible to pest infestations and a significant reduction in its domestic supplies may cause the nation to become a corn importer. Brazil is an up-and-coming corn giant. Its corn acreage and yield is increasingly watched. Unlike the Americans and the Chinese, Brazilian farmers are faced with a different problem. Delayed planting. In Brazil, corn is also planted as a second crop after soybeans are harvested to maximize acreage. The second crop corn has to be planted by mid-February to avoid the risks of drought and frost, which will largely reduce the yield of corn. This means that summer planting of soybeans in September cannot be delayed, but this is dependent on the arrival of spring rain that breaks the traditional winter's dry spell in Brazil. Argentina has planting and harvesting seasons that are similar to Brazil as these two countries are in the southern hemisphere. The EU, on the other hand, has planting and harvesting seasons that are very similar to the US. This chart summarizes all of the above planting and harvesting seasons. Green indicates planting and red indicates harvesting. The shade of color indicates the size of the crop planted or harvested. From the above, we can postulate that stocks are at their lowest and most uncertain from late May to mid-July and at their highest by November. Let's see what happens during these months. Corn futures prices typically trend downwards in June and July and spike in December. This coincides with harvest low and post-harvest rally. Harvest low is easy to understand. When output becomes more certain in July and harvesting starts in August, the entire crop supply becomes available to the marketplace in a relatively short period of time and, in turn, weigh on the prices. After the harvest low, a post-harvest hike usually follows. Inventory is at its highest and the price is at its lowest immediately after harvest, but the low prices will attract bargain hunters and draw down the supply. To ensure that some portion of the crop will be available for use later in the marketing year, markets will beat up the prices of deferred contracts. The spike in March is associated with low levels of current marketing year stocks and uncertainty of next marketing year output preceding the planting season. 
Strength of trend in the chart refers to the probability that any particular month follows the general trend of the month. This is the MRCI price chart showing 15-year and 40-year CBOT corn prices as of 2008, slightly outdated by showing more precise fluctuations in prices. Again, we see the same seasonal patterns. Prices rally in March and December, but tumble in July. How can we make use of these seasonal patterns? Two ways. The first way is very intuitive. Buy low, sell high. Buy in February and sell in March. Buy in October and sell in December. Sell in June and buy in July. The second way is a little more tricky. It is by spread trading of the different month contracts. Spread trading is the simultaneous buying of a particular security and selling of a related security against it to profit from the widening or narrowing of the net difference between the prices of the two securities. One possible spread is short December, long March next year. With the big picture of supply, demand and seasonality in mind, there are still many fundamental factors that will determine short-term fluctuations in prices. As a start, we should always ask ourselves these questions. What currently drives the price direction? What is the market focusing on? What are the markets that are highly correlated to the security? What are the factors driving related markets? For agricultural commodities such as corn, more often than not, the answer can be found in one of the following the pace and progress of planting and harvesting activities, beneficial and adverse weather conditions which in turn affect crop conditions, temporary supply chain disruptions, temporary trade restrictions, developments in the macroeconomic environment, and investor perceptions and positions taken by commodity funds. To round up, corn is one of the most demanded commodities and its futures are one of the most traded agricultural commodities in financial markets. With careful understanding and analysis of the factors affecting its prices, it is not difficult to trade corn futures. We have come to the end of the brief introduction to trading corn. Thank you for listening in. I am Joyce, Investment Analyst from Philip Futures. Please stay tuned to our next webinar.